Hi, my name is Amy Chun. I'm a Regional Anesthesia Fellow at Stanford University, and I'm going to talk about setup for peripheral nerve blocks. Here is a brief outline of what we will talk about. We will discuss nerve block setup and equipment required, documentation of nerve blocks, emergency equipment and emergency scenarios, and complications of regional anesthesia. To start out with, let's talk about what nerve block supplies you would gather to do regional anesthesia. You can take a minute to think about what you would gather or write down a list. Here's an example of what you would need to perform regional anesthesia. You need an ultrasound machine uh, with the appropriate probe, uh, typically it'll be a, a linear probe. You'll need ultrasound gel, some kind of probe cover or cleaning solution to clean the probe before using it. Gloves, uh, you can use sterile gloves, although for single shot nerve blocks, regular gloves um, will, should be fine if other appropriate uh, cleaning methods are, are uh, used. You need IV supplies, since every patient getting a nerve block will need an IV. You'll need some kind of nerve block needle. A 50 millimeter one is quite uh, is short. And, uh, these can be used for uh, blocks of the upper extremity, such as the interscalene, supraclavicular, or axillary. There are also longer nerve block needles available in the 80 to 100 uh, millimeter length. And these are better suited for blocks of the lower extremity or for patients uh, who are of a higher BMI. You'll need some form of local anesthetic. Uh, the example I gave is bupivacaine. Uh, typically, you'll need anywhere from um, 15 mils to 30. So I would draw it up in a bigger syringe so that you don't have to change syringes in the middle of a nerve block. You'll need lidocaine uh, to make a skin wheel if you want that uh, prior to inserting uh, your nerve block needle. You'll need gauze or some other form of um, cloth to, to clean uh, to clean off the ultrasound gel. Emergency meds and supplies. And then uh, you also need an anesthesia record to chart vitals, medications, and a procedure note. So next we'll talk about the emergency equipment needed. Emergency equipment should be readily accessible prior to performing a nerve block in case any complications such as LAST or local anesthetic systemic toxicity occurs. Some patients who are very anxious may also have a, a vasovagal response when you're performing the nerve block and uh, they'll present with symptoms such as fainting, bradycardia, or even hypotension. So you'll need emergency medications to treat any of the above. The medications you should have available include induction medication, such as propofol, and a paralytic. You'll need airway supplies, such as the bath valve mask uh, that's pictured here, or uh, LMA um, and uh, laryngoscope and ET2. You'll need some form of vasopressor, depending on what you have available. You'll need access to a benzodiazepine or low-dose propofol in case of a seizure. And of course, the main treatment for loss is intralipid, uh, shown here in the upper right. Prior to performing any nerve block, the patient will uh, need to have monitors placed. These monitors are key for monitoring last. So they include continuous pulse oximetry, a blood pressure that is cycling every five minutes, and continuous EKG monitoring. If you give patients any sedation during your nerve block, such as Versed or fentanyl, supplemental oxygen with end tidal CO2 monitoring uh, is suggested or should be available nearby. So where should your nerve block be performed? Nerve blocks can be performed in either the preoperative area or in the OR. They are advantages and disadvantages for both. A pre-op nerve block can be done early without much time pressure. There will also be plenty of time after you do the block to check that it's working. 
Doing nerve blocks in the pre-op do require a little bit more setup. The monitors, supplies, ultrasound, and medications that I mentioned previously must all be there. Some hospitals will have a dedicated nerve block area with all the equipment set up already and with the ultrasound available. Alternatively, you can have all your supplies and equipment in a mobile uh, regional anesthesia cart that can be pushed from bay to bay or around the hospital. Nerve blocks down in the OR or operating uh, theater have the advantage that most of your supplies, equipment, and medications are already there uh, because you might be using them for your OR case. The OR table is often uh, adjustable as well, which helps with positioning and ergonomics. That being said, when you perform a nerve block in the operating room, there's often more time pressure. You may have the surgeons and nurses watching you, and you, there might be some time for your nerve block to start working, so there might be some time waiting around. And then lastly, post-operative rescue nerve blocks done for pain control are typically performed in the recovery area or recovery room. Here is an example of what our pre-op block area looks like at Stanford. As you can see, there's a monitor available in the upper left. It has our pulse ox, blood pressure, cuff, as well as EKG monitors. We have our ultrasound in the corner. And then on the right hand side, we have our regional anesthesia cart, which has all our nerve block supplies, ultrasound gel, gauze, IV supplies, and medications. Emergency medications such as intralipid and epinephrine are easily accessible on the top of the cart. You might be able to see it's in a clear uh, plastic bin at the top. The nerve block cart is also mobile on wheels in case we need to perform a block elsewhere in the hospital. Also note that we have our block timeout sheet printed out on the wall, and then the last guidelines are also printed on the side of the nerve block cart. These are important cognitive aids for when you are performing a nerve block. Next, let's talk about consent for regional anesthesia. We'll take a moment um, to ask you what you do for consent for uh, spinal, and we'll also um, do an example of how we consent for nerve blocks. So consent for regional anesthesia. When you're thinking about performing a nerve block, there's some certain things you should always consider besides the consent and talking about the risks and benefits. You need to consider the type, location, and duration of surgery. You need to ensure that the type of nerve block you're performing will cover the area uh, where the surgeon is doing their procedure. So for instance, if the patient is getting ankle surgery, doing a femoral nerve block, just a femoral nerve block is not going to cover all of the ankle. You'll need to have good communication with the surgeon and the patient. Always discuss a nerve block with the surgeon uh, before performing one. The surgeon may plan to do a post-operative neuro exam or the uh, patient may have some other contraindication that you might not be aware of. So it's always good to talk about your plan with both the surgeon and the patient. It's also important to consider the post-operative plans. Will the patient have help at home if you do a femoral nerve block and they're unable to get up and move around themselves? Are they going to need uh, crutches? Do they have children that they're taking care of at home? And a long-acting supraclavicular block may not be the um, you know may not be the best thing for them. Contraindications. Uh, include patient refusal. That is an absolute contraindication. If the patient does want, not want a nerve block for any reason, then they have the uh, right to decline. Relative contraindications include anticoagulation, coagulopathy, local or systemic infection, and pre-existing neuropathy. These are all important things to talk about with the patient and to assess prior to performing a nerve block. Risks and benefits of regional anesthesia. The benefits include decreasing the pain of surgery and then decreasing the risks of general anesthesia, such as sore throat, respiratory uh, issues post-op, nausea, vomiting, and if the patient has other comorbidities, such as severe heart or lung disease, regional anesthesia 
is likely much safer than putting the patient under general anesthesia. Other benefits um, of regional anesthesia is that it's great for pain control, so the patient won't need as many opioids or have the side effects of opioids, such as itching, nausea, vomiting, and sedation. Risks of regional anesthesia typically are minimal, but include bleeding, infection, nerve injury, and block-specific risks for, um, for example, for the supraclav supraclavicular block include pneumothorax, phrenic nerve block, and then for their lower extremity nerve block, uh, risks include weakness and falling. So a timeout prior to performing any procedure is, is very important. It should never be skipped. This ensures that a standardized procedure is followed every time and that nothing is uh, forgotten or left out. So the essential components of a timeout include confirming the patient's identity, confirming any allergies they might have, reviewing their anticoagulation status, going over the surgery plan, the laterality of their surgery, and what nerve block is being planned. And part of the timeout also includes checking to make sure that all your monitors are on, your medications are available, emergency uh, equipment is nearby, uh, and that the patient has a working patent IV. Quick quiz question. So the purpose of the timeout is to confirm patient identity, site of surgery, nerve block to be performed, patient allergies, or all of the above. The correct answer is all of the above. Which of the following is an absolute contraindication to a nerve block? Pre-existing neuropathy, fever, thrombocytopenia, or patient refusal? The only absolute contraindication in this list is patient refusal. The other things are relative contraindications. For example, if the patient has thrombocytopenia, platelets of 80,000, 80, um, but they're sick, they're quite you know, sick, they're in the ICU and they need a wrist procedure done, then perhaps the risks of doing a supraclavicular nerve block will outweigh, the, the, sorry, the benefits of doing a supraclavicular nerve block will outweigh any risks of bleeding. These are discussions that you should have with the patient um, and with the surgeon as well. When injecting local anesthetic, whether it's you or your, uh, you that's doing the injection or your assistant helping you, remember to always aspirate intermittently every five milliliters to watch for heme return. If you see any blood in your tubing, uh, like here, stop injecting, assess the patient for any symptoms of loss, which we'll talk about in a, a slide shortly, and then redirect. And then if the patient has no symptoms, you can then redirect your needle and check for a uh, heme before injecting again. It's, all, it's also important to always watch the ultrasound screen as you're injecting so that you can watch your local anesthetic spread around the nerve or your target. If you're not seeing your local anesthetic spread, your needle tip may not be where you think it is, and you also need to stop injecting, adjust your ultrasound probe, and find your tip. To prevent uh, ner uh, nerve injury during injecting, always stop injecting if the patient is complaining of pain or paresthesia. Paresthesia meaning any shooting pains um, down their arm or down their leg or in the area that you're performing the nerve block. That can be an indication that your needle is either intraneural or too close to the nerve. It's also important to stop injecting if the in pressure it takes to inject the local is high. This may take some clinical experience before um, you know the difference between easy injection versus a um, difficult uh, high pressure injection. When, the, when it's very, um, takes a lot of pressure to inject um, local through the syringe during your nerve block, you may be intraneural. Whenever you do a block, you must document the procedure just like how you would keep a detailed anesthesia record in the OR. Here's an example of a procedure note from Nysora. 
On the left, you can see there's a space to write the type of nerve block you're performing, the laterality, and the time uh, the nerve block occurs. Other parts of this list include any pre-medication you may have given, um, the coagulations, checking the coagulation status, sterility, the type of monitoring you're doing, the type of equipment you use to do the nerve block, and then, of course, the local anesthetic type that you've given and how much. Remember to also document vitals and medications administered during the nerve block. This can be done as part of your intraop record or as a separate nerve block anesthetic record. All nerve blocks that are performed should have some kind of patient follow-up. This is to ensure that your patient does not have any complications, and it's also just good patient care to follow up after a nerve block. You can do the follow-up in person, such as visiting them uh, the day after surgery if they stay overnight, or a telephone call. You want to make sure that the nerve block is wearing off or has resolved. You want to make sure that there's no um, residual symptoms, such as numbness or tingling. You want to provide reassurance if the block is not resolved. Just make sure to follow again. Sometimes patients can have blocks that last you know, 24, 48, or even longer 20, um, after surgery. And you always want to document that the follow-up has been done uh, and if it's completed. Now let's talk about some regional anesthesia complications. We'll talk about peripheral neuropathy first and then local anesthetic systemic toxicity. So peripheral neuropathy, the risk of this is about one in a thousand. There's a wide range of... Um, risk of uh, nerve injury. It ranges from 2.8% for an interscaling block, 0.03% for a supraclavicular block, and 0.2% for a popliteal block. There's various types of nerve injury. The picture on the left shows an example of blunt trauma during a peripheral nerve block. Direct needle trauma can uh, sometimes can barely lacerate a nerve or more typically injure the perineurium, which is the protective membrane surrounding the nerve. Injury to the nerve or perineurium exposes the axons to potential local anesthetic neurotoxicity, so toxicity from the local anesthetic that you're injecting. Vasoconstrictors, such as epinephrine, that you're uh, adding to the local anesthetic may worsen injury by reducing local anesthetic clearance. Here are other forms of nerve injury. You've, you can have compressive injury. Uh, this happens, this is not necessarily related to your nerve block, but can happen in the operating room uh, from prolonged tourniquet use, from swelling. There's also stretch injury that can happen. Uh, that's from um, poor positioning. And then uh, there's also ischemic injury. Here's another example of what intraneural injection looks like. The slide goes over the treatment of peripheral neuropathy. Typically, if the patient has only numbness, you can just observe and keep following up. If they're having paralysis, uh, motor symptoms, or pain, that warrants further workup with a neurologist or a pain specialist. ASRA, or the American Society for Regional Anesthesia, has a nice set of guidelines on what to do for suspected nerve injury. It's a great resource to keep and go over whenever you have a patient with suspected nerve injury. The good news is that most peripheral neuropathies resolve by one year, and 90% resolve in four to six weeks. On the right-hand side of this slide has uh, treatment modalities for peripheral neuropathy. Now let's talk about local anesthetic systemic toxicity, or LAST. It's a feared complication of regional anesthesia. Um, it happens uh, about 0.87 per 1,000 peripheral nerve blocks, um, and it typically occurs minutes after injection, although there's cases um, where LAST occurs you know, up to 12 hours after the block has been done. Here are some symptoms of uh, last. It manifests with a variety of symptoms, typically starting with neurosymptoms such as altered mental status, tinnitus, uh, perioral numbness, seizures, and then 
progressing to cardiovascular symptoms such as arrhythmia, hypotension, and then cardiovascular collapse. Here's a slide showing uh, serum concentration of lidocaine uh, to symptoms. The study was done with lidocaine, but also applies to other local anesthetics, such as mepivacaine, bupivacaine, and ropivacaine. As you can see, with low serum, lower serum concentrations of local, um, the symptoms that manifest first are the neuro uh, neurological ones, such as numbness of the tongue, lightheadedness. It progresses to seizures, unconsciousness, and then finally to cardiopulmonary arrest. This is the most recent guideline from late 2020 for how to treat LAST. This is from the Azure Society. The big things to remember are to give intralipid and airway breathing, your ABCs, airway breathing circulation. The ultimate, I want to point out that the ultimate treatment for LAST is intralipid. You must give intralipid. It creates a lipid bank to which the local anesthetics uh, can be absorbed from the, uh, the, your um, vital tissues, such as your heart. For anyone over 70 kilos, which you can assume as many adults, you can just bolus 100 mils of intralipid over two to three minutes. Then you can give an infusion. Last, I want to point out too that last difference differs from ACLS and that the dose of epinephrine that's given is lower, shown down here in the bottom left. The full one milligram of epinephrine may cause hypertension and vasoconstriction which doesn't allow the intralipid to circulate into the coronary arteries. Remember that intralipid needs to reach the heart so it can take up the local anesthetic there so that the heart can start uh, work, uh, working again. Here's another outline of last management. It's important to have, do airway management, uh, your ABCs. Remember the seizure, the neurosymptoms can be broken with midazolam or small doses of propofol. You can always intubate um, and paralyze. Consider the intralipid early. Do not give propofol because that worsens hemodynamic uh, instability. And also you would need a lot, a lot of propofol in order to, for it to work as um, a lipid um, sink. And then remember your ACLS is different than uh, your, uh, your other algorithms for cardiac arrest. You do not give vasopressin, and remember you give smaller doses of epinephrine, less than one mic per kilo. Also remember, since uh, this is local anesthetic toxicity, do not give any more lidocaine, and then also avoid calcium channel blockers or beta blockers. If you are near a facility with cardiopulmonary bypass, alert them early. The patient may need to be transferred there and placed on bypass until the, lo the local anesthetic in their system is metabolized or removed. And remember, if you're ever suspecting last, stop injecting and call for help. Risk factors for last um, depend on the site of injection. So the upper extremity blocks and paravertebral blocks have an increased risk of last compared to the lower extremity blocks. Risk factors um, also increase um, if you're giving a higher a dose, obviously, of local anesthetic. Low patient weight, low muscle mass is a risk. Pregnancy is a risk, and also extremes of age, meaning the very young and the very old. So how do we reduce the risk of LASK? So as we discussed earlier, remember to always aspirate intermittently when injecting to watch for blood. Always calculate the maximum local anesthetic dose before injecting. So for bupivacaine, it's two and a half milligrams per kilo. Ropivacaine is three milligrams per kilo, and lidocaine is about four milligrams per kilo. Survey the needle path before doing any nerve block, looking for any vessels. Use Doppler, as shown here in the bottom right, to highlight any uh, potential arteries or veins in your way. Use low, lower local anesthetic doses and volumes when possible. And then always watch for the spread of local anesthetic under ultrasound guidance when you're injecting. So summary, in this lecture, we talked about nerve block setup. We talked about equipment and emergency medications, the importance of documentation and doing a timeout, and then 
regional anesthesia, in terms of regional anesthesia complications, um, I want to summarize that most peripheral neuropathies do resolve within a year and then always have intralipid available for last.